Hey guys, welcome back. Um, so we actually just have two weeks left in the school year, um, this week and next week. But remember that next week, we are gonna have school on Monday. Uh, so I'll put out a video on Monday, probably give you an opportunity to get some easy points. Um, but that's gonna be that for the school year. This week, next week, we'll be done. No finals either. Um, I do wanna talk about a little bit the end of the school year here though. Um, I'd said that at the end of this week, we were gonna do a lab notebook quiz. I don't know that the at-home labs and the two labs that we did are gonna be enough for to justify that really. Um, so instead, I'm gonna do something a little bit different. Um, I'm still gonna call it a lab quiz, but it'll be more of uh, scenarios that I'm gonna have you answering questions to that are related to lab tasks. Um, so you, it will involve math. You'll need to use a calculator to solve these problems, but I'm gonna count them as lab points. It's gonna be really important that you at least try that because if you get some of those points, it'll count more than, um, than turning in homework and getting those points because lab points are in a different category. Uh, we're not allowed to be giving finals this year um, just because of everything, uh, but I think that I, it would still be valuable to give you a mock final. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create an online version of a final. It'll be the same difficulty or a comparable difficulty to the real final. It's not gonna be for a grade. It's gonna be an extra credit type opportunity. Um, so that if you take that mock final and you do really well on it, you can still be rewarded um, by getting some of those points and improving your grade if you still need it to be improved some. The other benefit to doing a mock final like that is that you can get a real sense of how you did with the course. Um, you know, if you've been working hard all year, uh, you probably want to know if it's been paying off or not. You want to know how well you actually learned the material. So I want to give you that opportunity to really test yourself and see where you fall, but also to get the points um, in case you are still needing those points. So this week, we're moving on to a new PowerPoint. I've shared this PowerPoint with you so we can see these slides. Uh, we're gonna be talking about solutions this week, which is usually something I like to stretch out more. We do lots of labs, one of my favorite labs. Sad, we won't get to do it, um, but that's all right. So we'll talk about solutions this week, but today I'd like to talk about the ideal gas law. It's gonna be a really quick topic to get through. It's basically just an algebra formula. So we'll start on solutions tomorrow. Today, let's do the ideal gas law. I've got some discussion questions here. Now I know we usually do these discussion questions in small groups. Let's do it um, Dora the Explorer style today. So I'm gonna ask questions you think of the answers to yourself. You can shout them at your computer if you want. So what is a gas and how do gas particles behave? What is a gas? What's the behavior of gas particles? Did you say a gas has no definite shape or volume? You're right. Um, so gases, they're a state of matter that are very chaotic. Uh, they don't have a defined shape or volume. They fit the shape and volume of their container. Um, and they're very chaotic. Like I said, the particles have a lot of space between them. They're moving very quickly. What is a mole? What's a mole? Did you say that it's a unit of measurement in chemistry? You're smart. That's right. A mole is a way that we can measure things in chemistry. That's a good answer. A better answer, you could tell me that it's like a counting tool. Just like a dozen means 12, a mole also means a number. It's Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd power. So a mole, it's a really big number and it's a counting measurement, a unit. And then this last question here, how can you convert from Celsius to Kelvin? Celsius to Kelvin, did you say add 273? You're right. Remember to go from Celsius to Kelvin. 
we add 273.15 if you want to be really awesome. Um, and that'll give you the Kelvin temperature. The benefit of Kelvin, it's an absolute temperature scale. Um, so that's kind of the plus side to Kelvin. Haha, <laughs> it can only be positive. Whereas with Celsius, it's more relative. You can have positive or negative Celsius temperatures. When we're doing gas laws, we need it to be in Kelvin. We need it to be absolute. So I told you that we're doing the ideal gas law today, but what is an ideal gas? There's a lot of text on this slide. Feel free to read it, but please don't copy it all down word for word. I'm gonna tell you the important parts. An ideal gas is a hypothetical state of matter. Ideal gases don't exist in reality. In reality, we have these things called real gases, but we're not talking about real gases, we're talking about ideal gases. What is an ideal gas? Well, an ideal gas is one where the particles are so small, they take up negligible space. It's like those particles may as well not even exist. They take up negligible space. That's not real, it's idealized. And then the last part of this, the ideal gas, um, they never interact. Ideal gas particles never touch each other. They will never ever interact with each other. That's also not reality. In reality, gas particles are bumping into each other and they're, they're hitting each other. You can feel it if you move your hand through the air really fast. You can feel the, feel the air resistance. So no, ideal gases are not real. They're idealized versions of gases. So why do we need to study them at all if they're not real? It's because it makes the math a lot easier. The ideal gas law um, is at a level of algebra that a middle school or a high school student could do those calculations. The real gas law is a little bit more complicated. Um, and it's gonna give you approximately the same answer. The ideal gas law gives you a good prediction. It gets you close enough to the accurate answer um, that we can use it and it can be useful. There are times when you might have to use the real gas law, uh, but that's, that's high level chemistry, it's not something that we need to worry about too much. The ideal gas law is enough for us. So let's take a look at that formula here. Here it is, the ideal gas law. You're definitely going to want to write this down. We're doing all open note stuff here, so you want to be able to reference this gas law, the ideal gas law. Sometimes people call this pervnert. Pervnert sounds like pervert. Uh, PV equals NRT. I don't know why. I've heard it for years and years. That's just how people remember it, pervnert. So PV equals NRT. We've got five variables here that we need to consider. Really, it's four variables and a constant. P for pressure, V for volume, N for moles. R is a constant. And then capital T, that one is temperature. Pressure, volume, moles, constant, temperature. So four variables and a constant in this algebra formula. It is a bigger algebra formula, but the good news is you don't need to do dimensional analysis to solve these problems. You can just use those algebra skills that you've been working on to get your answer. When we're using the ideal gas law, we also need to make sure that we're using these very specific units. Um, for pressure, it needs to be in atmospheres. For volume, it needs to be in liters. N will always be moles. Um, capital T needs to be in Kelvin. Remember, any gas law, any gas law, it's got to be in Kelvin. And then R, the constant R here. It's got a derived unit, one of those combined units. So you're gonna have liters and atmospheres in the numerator and then moles and Kelvin in the denominator. So a four part unit for the R value, liters, atmospheres over moles, Kelvin. Um, that's just so that the other units will end up canceling out when you're doing your algebra. 
that'll probably be, it'll make more sense when we see it on the whiteboard wall in a little bit here. So you can see where I'm going with this. I just gave you an algebra formula. I'm probably gonna have you practice that algebra formula a little bit. Um, there is one more little wrinkle to this. Of course there always is. Um, and then I think we'll do like maybe two problems. I think most of your algebra skills are very good, so I'm not too worried about this algebra formula. Um, let's go ahead and see what that wrinkle is first here. So last little bit to talk about. Um, standard temperature and pressure. Sometimes we, sometimes we abbreviate this to STP, STP. It means standard temperature and pressure. These are set values. It's a set temperature and a set pressure. They're the standard. The standard pressure is one atmosphere. The standard temperature is 273.15 Kelvin, which is zero Celsius. It's freezing. So why do we need STP? Why do we need a standard? It's so that if we were doing experiments in different environments or atmospheres, that we could repeat the results. So if I was doing an experiment here in Indiana and some other team was doing an experiment in California or in England or in Asia or Australia, anywhere in the world, they could recreate that experiment by doing it at the same temperature that I did it and the same pressure that I did it at. Um, we standardize it. That way we're taking as many variables out of the experiment as we can, and we can control these things. We can control the temperature and the pressure of our lab space. Um, so anytime a story problem tells you that it's at STP, that just gave you two pieces of information. If it says it's at STP, you know that the pressure is one atmosphere you know that the temperature is 273 Kelvin. Um, and you've got to do it in that Kelvin. Don't do it in Celsius. Ideal gas law has got to be in Kelvin. Uh, one more little piece for this. Um, I remember when I was at IU, sometimes our uh, lab professors or our uh, TAs would tell us, we're going to do this experiment at standard temperature, or this experiment takes place at STP. And that was their way of warning us like, hey, bundle up for lab this week because we're going to do the whole lab at freezing temperatures at zero Celsius. Uh, so you want to make sure that we bring a jacket or a coat or something to do lab in. Um, so it's just like a fun little story. STP, it's a standard temperature and pressure. Zero Celsius, one atmosphere. I just want to take a quick look at the type of problems we'll be doing. And then we'll switch it over to the whiteboard wall to actually do these problems. Um, sometimes I might give you the variables here. Um, so I only gave you three. I gave you pressure, volume, and temperature. And then you're going to solve for moles. But there's five parts to the equation. I didn't give you the constant. That's because the constant is always the same. We'll solve that one a little bit. Uh, we'll probably skip this one. But let's look at this problem. How many moles of gas are in one liter of helium at STP? At first glance, it seems like this problem didn't hardly give me any information. I've got one number. I know that I have one mole. And it, at first glance, it seems like that's it. The other important part here is the STP. It's at standard temperature. It's at standard pressure. So I know that I'm going to use 273 Kelvin. I know I'm going to use one atmosphere and one mole. I could solve from there, and then the constant will always be the same. So I think let's do, whew, excuse me, let's do those two problems on the whiteboard wall. We'll do this one here that's filled in for us, um, and then we'll do a story problem here, uh, one that's also at STP, so we can get a look at what that looks like. Switching it over to the whiteboard wall. So here we go. I just want to make sure that we are comfortable using this formula to solve for a variable. Um, we're just going to do these two examples really quickly. Um, and we're just checking to make sure that we can go from the given information into the formula, solve for that variable, give it the right unit. 
all the little things that you might miss along the way. I just want to double check, cover our bases here. So, I do have our formula copied down here. Make sure you have this in your notes somewhere. It's good old pervner. PV equals NRT. We've got pressure, volume, moles, the R constant, and T for temperature. That temperature needs to be in Kelvin. Um, if we look at our given information this time, I've got a pressure of two atmospheres. Quite a bit of pressure. That's twice the Earth's atmosphere of pressure. Um, we've got three liters of gas. Uh, I don't know how many moles of gas I have, so that tells me that my final unit, it better be moles. I'm trying to find moles, so everything else needs to cancel out except for moles. And then my temperature here is 400 Kelvin, quite hot. So we're dealing with a hot gas that's under a lot of pressure. And we want to know how many moles are in that sample of gas. In order to solve, we're going to plug in chug. My first variable is P for pressure. And I know that my pressure is two atmospheres. So I'm going to copy that down. Two atmospheres for my pressure. My next variable is V for volume. And I know that I have a volume of three liters. Uh, coming to the other side of the equation, my next variable is N. Uh, I've said this in other videos. N, lowercase n, is the variable for moles. N is moles. I don't know what N is. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm going to keep it as a variable. I like to write the N. If you're more comfortable writing an X, because X is the variable that you're using solving for, that's fine. The math is not going to be affected. Now, my next value here is R. But I didn't have any given information about R. That's because the R value is a constant. It'll always be the same. The problem does not need to tell you what the R value is. You're going to need to be expected to know that. And that R value is 0 0.0821. This is approximate, um, but the entire ideal gas law is approximate. So it really is fine to, to cut it off there uh, at 0 0.0821. It's got that derived unit. Remember, derived unit. It's going to be liters times atmospheres, that's all in the numerator, over moles times Kelvin, and that goes in the denominator. It's all one unit, it's a derived unit, but it's made up of four different units. Um, we'll see how that cancels out in a second here. The last thing is temperature. I know that the temperature is 400 Kelvin. There, I went all the way to the wall there. Um, but this is my setup. I've got all my given information filled into the story or filled into the formula. My units are all good units for the ideal gas law: atmospheres, liters, and Kelvin. And I know that my variable is n, so I have something that I'm trying to solve for. At this point, I would multiply and divide. Um, until I could solve for n. And I'm going to show that answer in a second here. But first, let's take a look at these units and see how the units cancel out. On this side of the formula, I see that I have atmospheres, but I'm trying to solve for moles. I don't want these atmospheres here. I'm going to divide both sides by atmospheres. If I do it to one side, I need to do it to the other side. That's algebra. So I'm going to divide both sides by the unit atmospheres. Over here it cancels out. And guess what? Over here it cancels out too. Atmospheres are in the numerator. 
So if I divide by atmospheres, it'll cancel out. I'll do the same thing for liters. I see that I have liters on this side. I'll divide both sides by liters. And again, it cancels out. Um, and then finally, over here, I've got Kelvin. This Kelvin is in the numerator. It's not set up like a fraction, so it's in the numerator. It's like k over 1, you know what I mean? So even though it's not set up like a fraction, this is in the numerator. And then this Kelvin, this k, is in the denominator. So these two Kelvins, they actually already cancel each other out. The only unit that I have left is moles. But these moles are in the denominator. But during the course of my algebra, I would have ended up dividing these two values away. In order to isolate my variable, I would have ended up dividing by this value and then dividing by this value. When I do that, it's going to switch the moles from being in the, numer or in the denominator to being in the numerator. Um, so when I do all this algebra, uh, my units do cancel out nicely. The only unit that I have left is moles. It ends up in the right place. Uh, and my answer, my numeric answer, is about 0 0.18275. Moles. So how many particles of gas did we have in this sample? About 0 0.18 moles. If I was doing significant figures, I would base it off of this value right here, which only has one significant figure. I would only keep one, and I would use the next number to round up. So this is really about 0.2 moles. 0 0.2 moles. That's still billions of billions of particles of gas. Um, but it's not a huge amount. 0 0.2 moles. Let's do one more of these problems. Um, looking at a problem that's at STP. That's going to be our next one. All right, so let's wrap it up with one more story problem here. Um, and then I think that you have five ideal gas problems for your homework tonight. Should not take you too long. This time, the story problem didn't um, tell me what each of the variables was equal to. Uh, it was more of a true story problem here. I know that I have one mole of gas. I know that that gas is helium. And I know that the experiment was done at STP, so that's going to be important too. I've still got my pervnert formula here. We're going to go ahead and uh, start filling in these variables. Starting with P for pressure. So, it does not explicitly tell me what this pressure is. But what it does tell me is that it's at STP. Remember, STP is standard temperature and pressure. So I'm going to use the standard temperature for this problem. Remember that that's standard temperature, I'm sorry, standard pressure is one atmosphere. So I'll put one ATM there uh, for my pressure. Up next comes V for volume. Now, I didn't put it here, but the story problem asked me, what is the volume? If I was following my question word, I would have seen what, and then what is the volume? And I would know that volume is what I'm trying to solve for. I don't know what it is yet. So I'm going to leave it as a variable. This time I'll make it an X. Uh, again, I could have made it a capital V. It doesn't really matter what you pick for the variable when you're doing your own personal algebra. Coming to the other side uh, of the equation, we've got N for moles. I do know this one. I've got one mole. One mole. 
Up next, we've got R, the R value here. Um, remember that this is a constant. I was not given that information, but I don't need to be given the R value because it's constant. It'll always be the same. And that value is, if you don't have it, make sure you write it down, 0 0.0821. This is approximate, um, but it's okay to be approximate, especially with the I ideal gas law. My philosophy is that the ideal gas law is already flawed. It's already an approximation. So if I'm not using the most precise um, measurements, it's not gonna make a huge deal. If I was trying to be precise, I would have used the real gas law. Uh, and then my combined unit here, liters atmospheres moles Kelvin. My final piece is the temperature. It doesn't say it explicitly, but it does say that we're at standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature. Remember I told you that story about having to bundle up for labs. Standard temperature is cold. It's freezing. Zero degrees Celsius. But we can't leave it in Celsius we're gonna make that 273 Kelvin. Anytime we do gas laws, we need an absolute temperature, we need Kelvin. So it is zero Celsius, it's freezing, but we're gonna use the Kelvin, 273 Kelvin. I can show again that my units cancel out. Atmospheres, atmospheres. My moles cancel out. The Kelvin cancels out. The only unit that I'm left with is liters. And that's a good thing because this problem is asking me what is the volume? So liters make sense as a unit for my answer. Um, those liters are in the numerator and they're gonna stay in the numerator when I do my algebra. So my setup is already good. I can go ahead and solve right from here. 1 times x is just x. So really, all I need to do is multiply this side of the equation together. I'll leave it as an x since that's what I was working with. My unit is liters. And if I put all this into my calculator, I would get about 22.4 liters. So 1 mole of helium at standard temperature and pressure is going to occupy a volume of 22.4 liters. Uh, that's quite a bit of gas. You can imagine like 11 2 liters, uh, like a 2 liter of soda. You got 11 of those and they're all filled with helium. It's that much helium um, in one mole at standard temperature and pressure. But now, did it matter to this problem? that our gas was helium. Could I have put hydrogen or nitrogen or chlorine or some other kind of gas there? The answer is actually yes. It does not matter for the ideal gas law which gas you're looking at. It doesn't matter if it's um, teeny tiny gas particles like helium or great big gas particles like sulfur hexafluoride. Um, the real gas law takes that into account. The real gas law has extra variables to take all that stuff into account. But the ideal gas law is just an approximation. I would get the same answer for helium or hydrogen or any other gas. This is kind of what um, Avogadro was getting at. It was his big thing is that um, equal uh, volumes of these gases under these same conditions, it'll be the same number of particles. Um, so we've taken a look at our formula. Make sure that you have this formula in your notes. Uh, the constant here, the R value constant, you definitely want that in your notes as well. Um, the values for STP, standard temperature and pressure, you're gonna want those. 273 Kelvin, and one atmosphere. Um, if you've got all of that information and you've got the algebra skills, 
this is gonna be a really easy one for you. You'll get the homework done in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it'll be fast. Uh, definitely come to office hours. I enjoy seeing you guys. Um, we've got that lab quiz at the end of the week and that'll be worth some good points. And then we'll be doing that mock final next week and that'll also be worth some good points and give you an idea of how you actually did in the class. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all. Um, I hope you're enjoying the weather uh, and also staying healthy and making wise decisions. Be smart, be safe. I'll see you next time.